Hey, what's up? This is Gabe from Midtown, and you're listening to the Voice and Verse podcast. Hello there, and welcome to episode 10 of the Voice and Verse podcast. I'm your host, Evan Lucy, taking you through the stories behind your favorite songs. This week, I am very, very, very excited to welcome to the program Mr. Gabe Supporta. Most of you know Gabe as the frontman of electropop act Cobra Starship, the hitmakers behind songs like You Make Me Feel and Good Girls Go Bad. But before he hit the dance floor, Gabe served as frontman and bass player for celebrated New Jersey rock act Midtown, which would sign with Drive Thru Records and release two albums for the label before jumping ship to Columbia for 2004's Forget What You Know. That album would go on to be the band's last. They played their final show in 2005, and it took a full nine years before being coaxed into a reunion show. They are performing at the 2014 Skate and Surf Festival, May 17th and 18th in New Jersey, in celebration of 10 years of Forget What You Know. To commemorate the album, I caught up with Gabe over Skype to talk about its origins, major label horror stories, and just what happened to that Midtown Save sign they so proudly displayed back in the day. So, without further ado, I hope you enjoy this chat with Gabe Supporta. Give it up, give it up. We're just about two weeks, a little over two weeks until uh, Skate and Surf. How are you guys doing in terms of uh, getting the set together? I think we're pretty good. I mean, we, we, we have the songs really down down at, at a good place. Um, and, you know, I think that what we're missing is kind of, you know, just playing them in front of an audience again. I think their songs are pretty tight, but there's just something that comes with just playing lots of shows of a, a cohesive kind of uh, flow of the set that, you know, I don't think we have, and I think we're we're only going to find out if we have it or not when we're in front of people playing it at the skin surf. You got to round up all your family and friends and bring them down to the practice space. Yeah, exactly. But even that's not, it's not the same because they're just like, okay, cool. They're just like hanging out. They expect you like to stop and stuff. But when you're in a show, if you like, you know, if you stop for too long, you kill the energy or like whatever, you know. Does, like, some, or, oh, yeah. does somebody still have the Midtown Save sign, or is that gone at this point? You know, it's so funny you ask because we it's supposedly in my father's, uh, above my dad's garage, um, and I'm just such an idiot. I was there like a couple weeks ago, and I said I was going to look, and I totally forgot because I was too stressed out, you know, being at my, my, my parents' house having to do with my family that I didn't even think about. I was just like trying to get out of there as quickly as possible. <laughs> well, so, so it's not going to make an appearance then probably, right? Or are you going to go back? I don't know. I think I'm going back. I think we're going to go check it out because we have a, we have a lighting guy and he's like, and Heath is an electrician. So even if it's damaged, I think we can repair it. Nice. That'll be cool. Yeah. It'll be cool to, for the fans to see that. Um, so let, let's go back to like, what, like 2002, you guys put out... Um, Living World's Best Revenge. Yes. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah. yeah Living World's Best Revenge. Um, yeah. And that was on MCA. Was your deal with drive through like you, you got upstreamed? Was that how it went? Well, worked? I think that did it not have the drive through logo on it. I think it was, was it like a co. It might have been a co deal, but were you working with MCA or was it still like a drive through thing? Well, drive through, and I mean, I guess that was part of our problems with what happened with drive through is that basically drive through, you know, they took uh, you know our band and like you know and and the other bands that were happening drive through, and they kind of did a whole deal through MCA, didn't consult any of the bands and stuff. And like I kind of you know that that's that's how all the problem started is when they did their major label deal. Um, and, you know, I just remember we fought a lot. Like, I was a young kid. I was pretty, you know, pretty pretty idealistic and pretty, uh, pretty, uh, you know, I, I was pretty just, like, hurt about the whole thing. And I probably overreacted. But, um, but you know, we got into a big fight with drive through that, you know, we just kind of, um, we were like, well, fuck you guys. You guys did this major label deal, so we're not going to fucking deal with you anymore, you know. I don't know. It was, it was all crazy shit. <laughs> So, so did you have to fight to get off of MCA or did they let you go or what was the, no, well, what we did is, you know, I mean, like, you know, even in the song, they come with your hate, we're just like, you know, 
I'm not working for you no more. And then there's like, I remember that like, you know, when, when drafted to do with MCA, uh, I remember like hearing about the sound that Leonard Skinner did called, I think it's called like working for MCA when they realized that they were just like working and working and, and, you know, not making money because it was all going to the label. So, you know, we had a really shitty deal. You know, I, I, I signed because I wanted to sign with our friends and I really put friendship first and I, I had a lot of trust. And that's why for me, it was especially hurtful. I felt especially betrayed about that, about that whole situation when I realized that, you know, we were never going to make money and they were buying themselves mansions and stuff. And like, I'm just like, you know what? Fuck this. Like, you know, uh, so we just, we basically, you know, we had a plan. We're like, let's just stop everything we're doing. We're going to roll over and play dead, you know, uh, and just get off this deal. Because at the same time, we saw what was happening with like our friends were getting signed. Like my cam and Thursday were getting signed and they were getting signed. You know, their old labels were getting paid like a million bucks. Yeah. And that was money that wasn't going to their records to promote their records and stuff. And it was like, I was like, well, I don't want to start in a, in a negotiation like a million dollars in the hole, you know. So, but if we're worth nothing, we'll get out cheap. Uh, and that's kind of what we did. That was, our, that was literally our plan. We said, we said we're going to roll over and play dead and, and negotiate to get off the deal. At the same time, we'll be working on our, a new record that's going to be really important for us. And that's how we started working on Forget What You Know. And we spent like a year working on it while we pretended that we, that we were dead and over. Oh, wow. we, finally got, we finally got our lawyer to get directed to agree to let us go for like nothing, nothing in cash. But if we got signed, it was like set what we were going to get signed for. And then, you know, when, when, when we went and recorded Forget What You Know by ourselves with Butch Walker, we paid for the recording so that when we finally did get a deal, instead of that money going to our old label, it went to us. How did you get hooked up with Butch? Because at that time, he was not like the, the super pop producer that he is now. I think he had probably done like the, a, a couple simple plan songs and a, a, maybe the, something for Seven Dust, but he was not, you know, anywhere where he is today. No, not at all. We, we, we played a show with Butch. I mean, that's how we met him. Okay. Um, and you know that's how i met uh the manager that we have now jonathan daniel with crush i mean i met him at that show and he was just starting he only had butch as his client um and we just kind of you know we we met and then when we were when we were shopping a deal matt pinfield who was our a and r guy at columbia he's like actually before we were even at columbia matt pinfield just like called me one day when like living well is the best revenge came out and he was like dude i just gotta tell you i'm such a huge fan of this record like zero agenda like we're, wow. we're in it we're in a deal he's just like a fan you know like straight up and it's, it's so rare that you meet someone on the business side who's just a fan um and i was just like you know so we kept in touch from that i had never really spoken to him before like he met someone that knew me and he's like oh call gabe i gotta tell him how much i love this record and he just called and, and i was like wow that's amazing you know like i grew up watching you on tv and you know you're telling me you're a fan. It's, it's really cool. And then we just kept in touch. And, and while we were going through our whole shit of just like, you know, playing dead and just restructuring everything and trying, trying to start over and do figure what you know, uh, we met Butch's manager, who I remember we had met at a show. And, he's, and he actually helped us come up with this plan of like, let's just record this record ourselves and then we'll shop it, you know? Like, and we did it. <laughs> um, there's a great vignette in Butch's book where he talks about he was working on your record and you would to antagonize him you would sing the uh the chorus of mixtape in the vocal booth <laughs> i would <laughs> is that there's the, so many things that you know i i don't even know what song mixtape is at this point like is that one of his songs one of his that? songs that, that was like the big song that he had on his on his record letters it came out in like oh four i think yeah, you know, that sounds like something I would totally do, but I just have zero recollection of that. But that's amazing, yeah. It's really funny. I always, you know, I'm very, like, I wouldn't say I'm forgetful because I remember, like, a lot of details about, like, you know, important things. Like, I know my credit card number by heart, you know, like, dumb shit that other people don't know. But I don't remember, like, like things that just happen, you know? Like, when people tell me stories, I'm just like, fuck, that's really funny. I'm like, that definitely sounds like something I would have done, but I don't, I have zero recollection of that. You have to read his book now. It's very good. It's, it's, uh, uh, I want to read it. A lot of great stories. So, you, uh, so you were essentially playing dead at this point, but kind of secretly writing a record. Having done the pop punk thing, were you actively looking to get away from that, or was it just kind of a natural evolution of the Midtown sound? Uh, no, we were naturally trying to get away with it. You know, we were like, I mean, you know, to say we we're punk kids, I mean, like, you know, obviously we grew up in the punk rock, but we also very like, you know, like I started playing music. I didn't know what the music industry was. I didn't know there was a music industry, you know, and I had zero interest in it. And I kind of just found myself in the in industry and I was like, fuck, I'm here. I better figure this shit out. Um, and you know, I slowly had to figure it out, but, but at the beginning I was like a very like anti-establishment anti-organization like anti like 
everything anti bullshit like you know like all, like and not even like an anti my own bullshit too not even saying that like that like I didn't have any bullshit I was like my whole philosophy was like I remember propaganda had this this line in one of the songs that I call you on your shit you call me on mine you know and I was just like my whole vibe about everything and I just felt like there was so much bullshit going on everywhere especially with what happened in the pop punk thing like when we started like playing pop punk like for us it was like pop punk was like the analogous thing to like the, the hardcore thing. Like we were playing with like hardcore bands in basement shows and stuff. And we were like the kids playing pop punk, but pop punk at that time was like J church and discount and like, you know, propaganda and bands with messages, you know? So it's like when that started happening, you know, like uh, um, when, when the message started going away, just became out the pop and, and, you know, cute band boys and like, they're basically boy band rock bands. I got like, you know, I was really turned off by it and I was really turned off by by any any things that we were kind of either forced into or, or, or did that we didn't realize and we we're just like wow this is really just like not why we got into this um so we made a conscious decision to to go away from that absolutely 100 percent. well it's interesting that you know you guys kind of came up in that hardcore scene because you look at a band like fallout boy you know pete and patrick have talked time and time again about how when they were kind up in chicago like they the hardcore scene was the scene that was like the most accepting of them and and they kind of had to use that as their launching pad because the pop punk scene was you know was not uh, always the, the kindest to them. So it's interesting how those two scenes kind of work in uh, in harmony or discord sometimes. It's funny the Chicago pop punk scene was very interesting because it's like you know that I think that's where Screeching Whistle came from, right? Was in Chicago. Mm-hmm. Yep. And, and you know, and actually the first the first seven inch I put out before Midtown, I had a band called Whole Beginnings, and. I, you know, this was a, you could just reach out to bands and like, and I, we, you know, me and my friend were like, oh, let's put out a seven inch and we'll do it with my band and we'll offer, you know, to put, to pay for it for this other band called Oblivion who were Chicago pop punk band. But like the Chicago pop punk, you know, it was called pop punk, but it was very, it was very like Ramones punk rock, you mm-hmm. know, it wasn't like pop punk, like how, how we kind of think of it now, you know, it was really just like punk rock, you know, but, and, and it was like, you know, it was very political, and it was very like um, I don't know. I, and I, f- I feel like when when Green Day came out, it was very divisive for for all these bands. You know, like even Screeching Weasel had a song and they came out that like it's talking about like all their friends are getting famous and, and they're not. Like you know, mm-hmm. it, was, it was on a it was on a Punk in the USA compilation. It was, uh, you should look at that compilation because it's really just like shows like where the pop punk scene was, and it kind of like just split off at that point. You know. Yeah, and I think it's your your point about kind of being done with the pop punk thing. You see these bands like the bands that were on drive through at the time, like the starting line when they made their, I guess their proper um, MCA or Geffen, I guess whatever it was at the time debut. They were kind of that same kind of jaded band, and they were kind of rallying against the machine. And same thing with NFG. They were kind of, I, I think, um, angered that they were lumped into the the new crop of quote unquote pop punk bands, and they made Catalyst, which was kind of an angry record that expanded their sound and challenged their fans as well so i think what, what year did that come out catalyst catalyst was like 2004 i think yeah, yeah. or five one of those two yeah. years um so all that kind of happened around the same time it's interesting that there's that common drive-through thread i don't know what that what that says about uh yeah <laughs> you know all, all I, I don't know i mean you know the bad thing is look, looking back oops just kick my uh sorry the, ba- the bad thing is looking back is that um is you know that we weren't unified you know unfortunately like the the bands you know you, you get jealous of each other's competition and it wasn't like all the bands got together and said we're going to do this it was like people were just like kind of angry and just like didn't know who to rally against you know who or whatever so the, the, the good thing was at least with midtown we were unified within ourselves and we were like you know what we have a purpose you know and i remember like clearly articulating that purpose and we said you know we're going to make this record you know, we're going to roll over, play dead. Like we had a mission, you know, we're like, we're going to get off this deal. We're going to make this record and it's going to be a record for us. Like we're going to be proud of it. We're going to be excited. Like, and it's going to be something that we make and in 20 years from now. We're going to still be proud of, you know, mm. that's the goal. And that was really like the goal. And like, you know, it hasn't been 20 years. It's been 10 years, but you know, 10 years later, it still feels to me. I'm like still, I'm proud of that. You know, I'm just like, wow, I fucking made this. You know? <laughs> yeah. We talked last month and you said that, you know, every record, there's something you listen to and you point out like, oh, I could have done that differently. I wish I had, wish we had done that better, but forget what you know is the record that you would never change. And that's, that's cool. That, yeah. That I don't, you there's have- not one thing. Although Heath brought up something in practice the other day. He said <laughs> that we added a part and he could hear a bad edit. Like we added, um, in, uh, in empty like the ocean. He says we added like that part where everything cuts out and we just have like the, 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 the choir chant. 
and I, and he said that there, we added that afterwards and we had a hard edit that he can hear, but I don't, I didn't hear it. I don't remember that. <laughs> it's all ruined forever now. No, it's no, the only no, thing to be still... able to hear. Um, so what were you listening to at the time that you guys were writing? Uh, I forget what you know. Fuck. I don't remember. Um, <laughs> Well, it's, I was, you know, I was working at that time. I was working like, you know, while we were playing dead, I'm like, I didn't know if we were going to be able to get off the deal, but like, I was pretty clear that I wasn't going to keep, you know, doing a band and, 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 and making other people money, you know, like that just, you know, I, I'm down for like everyone makes money together, but you know, the bands and those deals were just getting raped. Um, and it wasn't cool. You know, it wasn't cool. I treated with, didn't feel like, didn't feel like, Oh, you know, you're not going to get money for a little while, but then we can do it. You know, it was just like, no, we're going to fuck you. Um, so I was like, I was, I started working on this stuff and I started, um, I don't know if you noticed, but I was managing Armor for Sleep and I was managing this band called Christensen. Oh, wow. um, so yeah, I remember I was listening to a lot of that. I was listening to another band. I put out uh, an EP for a band called Lance's Hero from San Diego. Um, so I was listening to like a lot of like uh, kind of underground stuff that was um, kind of a little more aggressive, you know, like I feel like I was listening to the Hives a lot at that point. I was listening to they refused, um, and and uh, oh, what's the band that that the dude from the refused started afterwards? Uh, no, Noise Conspiracy, International Noise Conspiracy. Yeah. So it was definitely it was definitely more rock and roll. Like you know, people were having this kind of like they they wanted it to be like more kind of rock and roll and like less just like punk. You know. Right, and you hear that off the bat, and, and a lot of people probably think you probably got this this tag. I, I was reading the Punk News Review, which is a, which is not the best thing to do. Uh, of forget what you know, and they were like, "This is the sellout record. This is the major label record when the money gets involved." So it's so funny that you wrote this, you know, with nobody's outside influence. You were just writing a record for yourself. Yeah, I, I mean, I completely disagree with that. To me, like the money was like "Living Was the Best Revenge," which is like a record that we do with the same producer did our first record, but he was getting pressure to make it sound all slick and really like Blink One Eighty Two, you know. And on our first record, he made a punk record. On the second record, he like totally made it very, very slick. Which you know, it's fine. I mean, at that at that at that time, it was like it was like to have a really slick record was a very major label thing. But now, like every record is slick, you know. Mm-hmm. I don't even, people don't even use the word slick anymore. It's like a bad thing. <laughs> Yeah. It's just it's just the status quo, and it's it's weird when a record is not when it doesn't sound like that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And you you, you were singing a lot more on this record. Was that what do what do you attribute that to? What do you mean? You, you handle uh, ninety ninety percent of the vocal parts, right? Oh, more than in the past. Yeah. Um, you know, I think that what was happening in the past was also like, um. You, you know, like a couple of different things happen. Like one is, you know, a lot of the stuff that I wouldn't sing would be like something I would write and I couldn't figure out how to sing it. Like, you know, Midtown was the first band that, 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 I, that I sang in my old band. I just played bass and, you know, um, I felt like, you know, I was kicked out of that band and then I felt like I got fucked. I put on this work. Imagine if like Pete once was kicked out of Fall Out Boy. That's kind of like what happened with my old band. I was just a bass player. Like people knew me, but like, you know, I wasn't like unified with my singer and he just kicked me out and he's like, you know, fuck you. This is my band. I'm, I'm the singer. I'm like, okay. So, you know, I, I wanted to sing so that I would have, I, I, that wouldn't happen to me again. Um, and that I didn't know how to sing. So, you know, a lot, a lot of the parts like Heaton Tyler took over. Um, but this record was like really personal to me. So I felt like I wanted to really, you know, it'd be weird for me to have like someone else sing, sing like lyrics that are so personal to me. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the, the lyrics definitely, there, there's a d- big shift from, from um, living well to forget what you know. I think the word, you know, the words that you would put in a, in a, cl- a word cloud are like alone, numb, nothing. The words that just like get used the most, but <laughs> uh, it's kind of a depressing record. It's very, very nihilistic um, in a sense, very cynical. But w- was that a byproduct of, you know, the the way that you felt you were treated by drive through or were there like other compounding things going on at the time to kind of pull out those dark sides of you? Oh, fuck i don't know like i feel like you know i was always very into like existentialism and stuff when even even in high school um and you know i feel like for for you know the theme of the first midtown record was kind of like more dealing with a girl you know like and and kind of understanding the world through a girl and it was it's it's a crazy story there was a girl that i that i dated at the time that i wrote that record was this girl whose sister had died of leukemia 
And I, you know, I kind of just like understood the world and her pain. And I felt like I had to save someone, you know, the record was called save the world, lose the girl, you know, it was like, mm-hmm. and it was like me, you know, like, okay, having to save someone, help someone and like also go into the world. And then like, I kind of went through all that shit and I felt like I got to a point where, you know, I definitely didn't believe in, in, in anything, you know? Um, and it wasn't just about drive through. Like, that's just, you know, that's like, that's just like of this world. It was very like, you know, it was just like something that happened. And I felt like we won that case at the end anyway, you know, mm-hmm. on our second record, I feel like I was angry about drive through, but, uh, by the time the third record came out, I was like, I didn't give a shit about that. Um, it's a lot of soul searching then. Yeah. I was just kind of like trying, you know, I felt very, uh, it was definitely an existential record. I felt very, uh, kind of dark and empty uh, and it was good you know I, I think the amazing thing about writing music and like having that be my job is that I really like get to deal with my shit in a way that other people you know aren't forced to you know mm-hmm. they, they kind of can put it away and deal with it later or they're forced to deal with it you know or when they have kids or this or that and I really felt like you know I, you know go doing that record and going through that darkness was really important for me. I, I couldn't have been able to go ahead and do something like Cobra Starship if I hadn't dealt with my darkness in that way. I really, really understood what, where it was coming from and what it was. It's like night and day. You're like able to able to let go of the darkness and embrace the, the light a little bit. Well, yeah. But I mean, but the only way you can really let go of it is if you completely immerse yourself in it. You know, yeah. I felt like I felt like that I really like went all the way into the darkness because it's only when you're in complete darkness that you can see the true light, you know? Mm. Well, as I understand it, now you're, you're getting more into your to your Jewish roots. Uh, yeah, you could say that. Uh, you, I, I read an interview with you where you, you were, you went to a, a Kabbalah, is it a temple or? Yeah, you know, I, I mean, you know, all these words are so charged, you know, like Jewish, religious, God, like, you know, the, I feel like for me to be able to, to get to the point where I am now where I'm, I'm, I'm understanding those things, like for me, like all those things, I can explain them in a scientific way that makes sense to me, you know, like, um, you know, and for me, like, I, I feel I feel that there is like something very mystical that somehow has survived since like the, the dawn of, of civilization about, you know, the creation of the world and how, and our place in it and what our role is. And I feel that, that when you start thinking about that, like, you know, especially when you get to the age when you're going to have kids and stuff, you're like, okay, well, why am I having kids? What am I passing down if I'm going to have kids? Like, what's my purpose in having kids? What am I, what am I continuing? And then you start thinking about it. Okay, well, what was passed on to you? Where did it come from? Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, so I definitely, you know, I've always been like a spirit, I've always been a, see- a searcher, you know, I've always been like seeking and trying to find answers um, and asking questions. Um, and I feel, you know, uh, you know, when you keep asking and asking and asking and asking, ultimately I feel like you have to start dealing with the spiritual aspect of it. Mm-hmm. Well, it sounds like you're in a better place now <laughs> than, uh, than 10 years ago, so. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely better place, you know. Uh, and I, I'm trying to think about where I was when I just forget what you know, like. I, you know, I, I probably was much more depressed when I did Save the World as a Girl than when I did Forget What You Know. But Forget What You Know was more of like my reckoning with, with all these things. Like, you know, okay, I know what this is. I know where this comes from. I know this darkness. Like, really like getting to know that, the darkness. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, so why did you guys go, decide to go with Matt Pinfield and, uh, and Columbia? Uh, did you have a lot? Did you, was, were there a lot of labels lining up at your door? Or did you? Yes, they were all lining up at the door. And that, that was a crazy thing. It's like we signed this deal to get off the drive through. We were free agents. We had a finished album that people were excited about. We played two shows, one in New York and one in LA. They're both sold out. And like this was the, the beginning days of the internet. Like MySpace had just happened. And we had put up Is It Me, Is It True on the internet like a week before the shows, and every kid was singing along the words. So labels were just like, what the fuck? Like these kids know this word's a song they just put up a week ago, you know? Like, so, uh, so we had like a little bit of a bidding war and, you know, we liked Pinfield. So we ultimately went with them. And, uh, no, um, no one from the label came in and told you what to do on the record. It was, it was no, done. It was fully done. It was and, done. Um, the, the only thing they tried to tell us to do is I remember that they were like, you know, we have these photos of us on the inside where our faces are all fucked up, and that was kind of like that was kind of like part of it. I, w- I wanted to be like, okay, let's 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 bring out the ugly. Um, 
And and I remember like the label's like, oh, maybe we shouldn't put those photos. Maybe you guys should be on the on, on the back cover of the record. I'm like, no, I don't want anyone on the cover of the record. Like, there's a purpose to like why this is a guy and then he's gone, you know, and then there's nothing. Mm -hmm. uh, like, it's not it's not. Hey, let's put the band on the back of the record. And I had to have like a whole argument with like the president label being like, you know, because they wanna. They're like, oh, you guys are good looking guys. Let's just put you guys on it, you know, like. And that's 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 always the vibe. And it's just like sometimes that. That just cheapens it, especially for what we were trying to do. You know, sure. that's why I'm, I'm saying. Like, you know, it was probably super frustrating for the label. Be like, dude, we're putting money behind you. And we're trying to sell this shit and get you guys heard, and you're like fighting me. But at the same time, I'm glad that I did one record in my life where I compromised zero. Yeah. You know, there was zero compromise in that record. I'm very flattered. Just don't put me on the on the cover anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I feel like if you if you had made if you had signed and then put and then went and written the record, I don't think a, a major would have been cool with like three three instrumental interludes and some of the a thirteen minute final track, the way that the record ended up. Yeah, who the fuck knows? To be honest, you know, I, I don't think at that point, like you know, when we made Living Was the Best Revenge, like the label just kind of stayed out of it. They they. they they didn't know what to do with us. They didn't care. They're just like, you know, I remember I don't know, I got came once uh, and then we were on tour. <laughs> this is so funny. This guy doesn't even work in the music business anymore. Um, but he was like the head guy and this is why he doesn't work in the music business. And, and we were like on tour and we played Chicago and our record was coming out the next day. Uh, I think we're, I don't know who we're on tour with. I think the movie life. And after our set, I went to go see the faint who were playing at another club in Chicago. And I see our fucking A and R guy at the faint. And he like runs off and he's like, so like nervous to see me. I'm like, Hey, what's up? Dude, you know, our records coming out tomorrow. Douchebag. <laughs> so, so it was like, uh, you know, I, I, they didn't care about us at, at MCA. And I, it's funny because our manager who, who's our manager now, Jonathan so said that he took a meeting you know, he was looking for bands to, to, to work with and he had taken a meeting with a guy who was our A&R guy who was like the head of A&R at the company and he's like, oh, what about this band? They, they rock, they're great, like Midtown. And he's like, oh, no, we're probably going to drop them. They're too much trouble. It's like, what? Like, isn't this the home of the doors? Like, <laughs> like, like, rock bands are supposed to be trouble. They're supposed to like, be like, fuck you, you know? Yeah. So not, that was, yeah. You know, it's all about the bottom line these days. Yeah, you know, I, I think, I think now we're at the point where like, people are realizing that that if you if you if you if you start with the bottom line, you get nowhere, you know. Mm -hmm. So it's like so. Something I think I think now it's probably even a better time of music than it was then. Then it was just like you know we're coming off of like the '90s heyday of music and trying to like make that last while it's dying. So it's like there was a big shift, you know. And kinda, then kinda, and then in the early yeah. two thousand early two thousands, it was everybody trying to sign the next Blink. Yeah. Maybe from the punk world. I mean, from, I yeah, from the it. punk punk. Once they did Enema, and once they kind of crossed over, it was like, get me a, get me, get me a blink. And uh, yeah, but they had they had newfound glory. They already had a blink. That's why that's why they had newfound glory. It was like it was like they were kind of like doing their thing with MCA, but it didn't really like work with them. And MCA was absolved, you know. And then and and then like I think that was the time people were like looking for the white stripes and like looking for the next Nirvana. That was like the big thing back then. You mm -hmm. know, people were just like, I, don't, I feel like after Blink, people stopped giving a shit about pop punk, which is kind of good for pop punk, you know. And now it's uh, now it's uh, mandolins and and banjos and boot stomps and stuff. Oh God, yeah, I think that's over already too, though. Mercifully, um, "Give It Up" was the first single. What do you remember about writing "Give It Up"? Ah, uh, it's got a great bass line in the intro. First of all, yeah. Where did I come up with that? I think I came up with that on tour. I remember like. I was playing that bass line on tour and we were like jamming on it. So that was one of the first things that we had. Um, and then it has influenced that song. We were also listening to, I'll tell you what, we were listening to also Blue Oyster Cult. Tyler and Heath like love Blue Oyster Cult and it has a part in Blue Oyster Cult, a part similar to like the chorus on da 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 you know, Don't Fear the Reaper, mm -hmm. I think. So, uh, and then lyrically, that really was kind of like, my grandfather passed away right when I wrote that, and I felt like he was kind of alone when he was dying. You know, it was just like, and and like I felt like all his mistakes had come to haunt him while he was dying. So it was just like I just that's almost about you know for me not ending up in the same place. Did you know it was the single? At what, at what point in the process did you know it was like the quote unquote single? Probably once we started talking to the labels and stuff, I think I think Pinfield was. I no, I think what happened was we had four song demos that we were playing. This is what happened. So we had like four song demo that I was playing around for like labels in Pinfield, and Pinfield is the only one that heard it. And I remember like our lawyer had sent it to the labels. This is before we recorded the album, 
and no one was interested. Pinto was like, this is fucking awesome. And that's when he hooked me up with my manager, Jonathan. And Jonathan's like, this is fucking awesome. The labels can't hear it. You know, it's, it's, it's like you guys demoed this in your basement. You know, they, they, can't, they can't hear it unless it sounds polished. But fuck them. Let's go record this on our own. And then, and then we came back like three months later with the exact same songs. Uh, and everyone was excited about it, you know? <laughs> I go figure. Um, the last song is, 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 am I correct? And it's an homage to Jimmy Eat World, and at least in some way. Yes, absolutely. That's amazing. It, yeah. You know, it, it shifts like kind of halfway through, less than halfway through because it's 13 minutes long. But who, whose idea was it to kind of like, hey, let's do this and let's have this outro that repeats and repeats and you've got the two vocal parts? And um, I don't remember whose idea it was. We, we definitely like, uh, I, 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 I don't remember, but you know, we, we collaborated on that. I, f- I feel like I had, I definitely, I, I, you know, I'm a huge Jimmy world fan to this day. So Jimmy world is definitely like an influence on that. Um, and we just wanted to do something that like, Oh, I remember why I wanted to do that. So I, when I was younger, I used to listen to, um, Sonic Youth and on the album Washing Machine they had a song that just went on for so long and I remember like being a kid and I fell asleep listening to the song and woke up and it was still going on I'm like I want to have a song that's like that like someone could just listen forever you know that's awesome yeah it's uh it's kind of a it's not a jarring thing it just kind of fits but the the first half of the song is very uh the first half of the song is jarring well, yeah, I mean, the, the transition's not super jarring, but like the the way that you, you go from a song that's just like kind of out of the gate kind of hits you in the face to something that's so beautiful and and um, calm at the end is it's it's a cool uh, it's a cool thing. And it's um, are you, you going to be playing it live at uh, Skate and Surf? We are. Yeah. Nice. All 13 yeah, minutes. No, we, we, we have a live version that we do. We cut it short a little bit. OK. Yeah. Um, you know, when you when you look back on the record, what are some of the songs that are that are your favorites? Huh. Um, depends for what, you know, like playing live, like help me sleep. It's just such a fucking rocker, you know? And it's like, when you get to the part where it's like the breakdown, it's like, da, 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 da. it's just like so heavy. I'm just like, wow, it's fucking awesome. And that riff that we all play together is awesome. But you know, I always was partial to, is it me? Is it true? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, lyrically personally for me, like, and then it's like, there's something like, uh, you know, it's also like the kind of song like I've played just on acoustic guitar, and it still like works. There's something nice about that song. What was the what was the writing process? Did a lot of stuff start on acoustic guitar in Midtown, or was it uh... almost almost uh, almost exclusively started on acoustic guitar? That the whole record, I would I would just come up with stuff on acoustic guitar and just start putting it together. Okay, was yeah. it was it a long process to make to to write the songs, or did once you had a vision in mind, did it come kind of kind of quickly? <sighs> You know, I can't remember. I feel like it probably took over a year because, um, you know, different songs would come at different points. Um, you know, I remember like in Take the Ocean started with just that riff I had. That do, 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 yeah, do, it's a great do. riff. Thanks, man. And then, uh, but I, I remember playing that on acoustic guitar. I remember I had moved to Jersey City. I was living in Jersey City, like in the fucking ghetto. Like <laughs> I didn't furnish for anything. And I just had, I just had an acoustic guitar. I remember playing that. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the interludes um at what point in the process did you kind of want to be more adventurous and be like hey like we can do we can do interludes we can do one with gang vocals we can just do one that's that's just um you know kind of piano um um i think from the top you know like we had we had the idea that we wanted the album to feel like you know an adventure from beginning to end um and we wanted to have different sections like different movements so that's how kind of we um, we came up with that. Okay, um, you know I I don't know if there are any plans for more for Midtown music or whatever. But what would a Midtown song sound like in 2014? Would it kind of be, you know, g- given that you guys have all kind of taken different paths since then? Heath was in Census Fail. You've gone on to do Cobra. Like, what do you think a Midtown song would sound like in 2014? Fuck, I don't know, man. And you know, for the reason why for me, like, I was so resistant to do anything was because I felt like we put so much into it, you know that it would be hard to like do something else after that to follow that up. I like, you know, it's like that album's pretty dark, like you said, but you know, I kind of like left all my darkness there. There was like, there, I put everything into it. It's like, there it is. Mm-hmm. And it's like sealed for forever. So it's just like, and I don't have that darkness anymore. Um, 
which is, you know, it's a blessing. So it's, it's great that I was able to go through that and have that. So, you know, if we did something else, it just wouldn't be as intense. So I would feel like really weird about doing something that's like not as intense afterwards. Yeah. Although I have like a couple, two songs that I feel like would be good for Midtown. And we try to, we, we try to play them, but um, we worked on them. But also, you know, I feel like everyone just has different priorities at this point. Um, even though it would be nice to dream. <laughs> <laughs> well, what's, uh, what's going on with Cobra? You were in the studio demoing stuff or with, with Kara or what's... Uh... Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so I have like a ton of new songs. Um, and we'll see as soon as, as soon as we feel like one is ready to go, we'll probably put it out. Um, you know, I got married last year and I just, mm-hmm. I just want to... I, I felt like I needed to take a break. I was touring for like six years straight with Cobra. Um, and, you know, I, I, I wanted to just like get married and like be home and be with my wife and not be like, okay, cool. We're married. I'm going on tour in two weeks, you know? <laughs> no, I mean, I know a lot of people have done that. Well, it, the thing is, you know, again, you've been doing this since you were, since you were a teenager, you know, like you, you've, you've earned a little bit of time off there. Right. That, that's what, that's how I feel about it. <laughs> <laughs> um, where can people find out about you online and, and stay up to date with all you've got going on? Um, you know, I use Instagram more than anything. Um, so my Instagram is just my full name, Gabriel Supporta. Awesome, Gabe. Well, thank you so much, man. Is is, uh, is there anything else you think people should know about the record or what you guys have going on at, at Skate and Surf or anything? Um, well, yeah, people should know that we're, we're playing at Skate and Surf and reuniting. I still have people that like... <laughs> You know, I'll post a Midtown photo and people be like, get Midtown back together. I'm like, motherfucker, we're playing in two weeks. Where are you? <laughs> people need to follow you. That's why people need to follow you on Instagram. Yeah, but I'm, no, they should have, if they want to find that information, they shouldn't follow me. I post like stupid shit that's not, I, I don't promote on my, on my Instagram. <laughs> well, everybody should go out to Skate and Surf. This will be airing a few days uh, before the show. And I want to thank you, Gabe. Appreciate it. And uh, hopefully I can make it up there and see those sets in person. It's been a long time. Awesome. Thank you so much, bro. Well, there you go, guys. That about wraps it up for this week's show. I would like to thank Gabe for coming on and talking shop and uh, reliving some old memories. And I'd also like to thank Rob Hitt over at Crush for setting this up and making it happen. If you are in the Northeast, you should definitely go to Skate and Surf the weekend of May 17th and 18th. That's this weekend if you're listening to it in real time, or it's in the past if you are listening to it after Uh, May 17th or 18th. If you are listening afterwards, you missed a great show. If you are listening in the present, you should go because it's going to be awesome. Uh, If you would like to stay in touch with us, here are all the ways you can do so. You can go to the website, www.voiceandversepodcast.com, Facebook, facebook.com slash voiceandversepodcast, or Twitter at twitter.com slash voiceversepod. You can also subscribe to the podcast on iTunes or Stitcher. There will be links to both of those services on the website under this week's show page. So go do that. If you like what you hear, please feel free to leave us a nice review. Five stars would be great. And then come back in two weeks for another episode of the Voice and Verse podcast when we uncover more of the stories behind your favorite songs.